tender, and it propelled Shalyapin to world fame. It established Diaghilev as an impresario of unique talent, a talent that would make his name one of the most famous in the theater for many years. In time, he would fuse the best of modern music and painting to achieve a completion of total theater. He always found the right painter, the right artist for the decor. Had an, had an extraordinary knowledge of music and always managed to find the right composer, like uh, Poulain for Les Biches, like uh, Auric for Les Matelots. Until then, it was, what, with the Anstel Dilip, Maximum, and Tchaikovsky was great, but the rest was awful things, like, uh, you know, Minkus and so forth and so on. Mm. He um, introduced all this new music to them. Can you imagine he commissioned Debussy and Ravel and Stravinsky and Prokofiev and Auric and Poulenc and all, all these people? Ever since his short term at the Marinsky, Diaghilev kept his eye on the theater. Meanwhile, the School of Theatre Street in St. Petersburg was developing outstanding dancers. Both Benoit and Nouvelle were confirmed ballotomains and for a long time have been trying to convert Diaghilev into the appreciation of the dance. Gradually, their persistence began to bear fruit. Jagler's budding interest was further increased by a new young choreographer, Michael Fokin, who, influenced by Isadora Duncan, was taking liberties with the traditional ballet patterns. And two young ballerinas attracted his attention. They were Pavlova and Karsavina. However, there occurred an incident that may have been most instrumental in the developments. Jagalov was introduced and fell in love with a young dancer, Václav Nizhinsky. Soon after that meeting, Benoit had no trouble in convincing Jagalov to bring the Russian ballet to Europe. Jagalov had raised the money to subsidize the venture and secured the Théâtre du Châtelet. To be on the safe side, the first season was a combination of opera and ballet. And woe to the opera. The ballet overshadowed it, despite the presence of Shalyapin. Summer vacation at the Marinsky enabled Jagalov to collect a sensational cast. Pavlova, Karsavina, Bolm, Nizhinsky, and Fokin, whose choreography was to bring the ballet to its greatest heights. The repertoire included Les Sylphides, music by Chopin, Decor, Benoit. Feed was the first abstract, storyless ballet, and it opened a new era in the art of the dance.
journey to Diaghilev was nothing but a convenience to be spent. The theater had to reflect the opulence of his performances. And since the Châtelet was a barn of a theater, he refurbished it from top to bottom to suit his taste. Even the seating was given great care. And at the opening night, only the most beautiful bejeweled actresses were placed in the front row of the dress circle. became the hallmark of the Ballet Russe before the First World War. Here we have the remnants of the opulence of Diaghilev's early era, which was indeed one of splendor. An exhibition such as this can be only a pale replica of past glory, but still, it will give us an idea. Here is Shahrazad, 1910, music by Rimsky Korsakov. The part of the Golden Slave was danced by Nijinsky and Zobe Ida, was the beautiful Ida Rubinstein. The decor and costumes of Leon Bakst were met with an absolute furor of applause. And the beauty and the savagery of the performance left the audience spellbound. The influence of Bakst was felt everywhere. And suddenly Paris was ablaze with bright colors and design, interior decoration, fashion, whatever it could be applied. Still, Diaghilev was not satisfied. He wanted something completely new, something which would be considered his own creation, a vision of his beloved Russia. So, he commissioned his young friend Igor Stravinsky to compose the music to a Russian fairy tale, The Firebird. Stravinsky's music sent Pavlova into a retreat. She refused to dance to such weird sounds, and Karsavina took over the part of the Firebird, producing an unforgettable image. Diaghilev's relation with his composers was intense, but Stravinsky occupied a special place in his life. The Firebird was the beginning of a long and important collaboration which was to give the world many lasting works. Petrushka, The Rites of Spring, Apollon Messager. It is said so often that uh, Diaghilev discovered Stravinsky. It isn't quite no, true, it is it? No, it's not quite true, but uh, how to say discard? You can, uh, if you find suddenly a book and take, oh, how interesting, and I said, you discard the book here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, discovering is no, finding is something that has never been seen or known yes. before. But Stravinsky did he have... He had once... Uh, he, he had no, once no, right. the fair work. Fair a work. very short yes. piece, you know. Yes. And said, oh, this man has talent. So, probably, you know. And wanted to see him. Did he impose his will or suggestions? on the composers, the ones that he worked with. No, with Stravinsky, it was very difficult. Stravinsky didn't allow to cut anything, you know. Yeah. Nothing, not one bar. I never had anybody saying, no, Mr. Diagrophis, I don't think it's like that. They all accepted his judgment, including Richard Strauss, Stravinsky, Faya. He would see any lengths, be it three, four bars or phrase, he would say, this must go out. And there was nothing doing. He, he would say, it was right. When he said, the fire, uh, you know, matter, uh, you have uh, that dance of governor in the second part, which really doesn't belong to the 
to the story, who wants to see that you know, a man doing his uh, reverences and gavots, you see, fire cut it out. He said, musically, it is a pastiche. And he was right. It was very well written, but it doesn't belong to it. Everything was, was, uh, everything was under his strict control. I remember about uh, that in connection with uh, Poulenc, uh, Le Biche, you know, yeah. that, that ballet. The, uh, some of the tempis, which uh, the choreographer, which was uh, Nijinska, yeah. Nijinska, was absolutely, uh, absolutely uh, with no connection with the, with the original, with, with the uh, origin, original tempo. Something very funny, <coughs> probably everybody knows it, uh, they were uh, in Venice, Jagilev liked all this Venice and Strange also. In the Grand Hotel, it doesn't exist anymore, the Grand Hotel. And uh, Stravinsky wanted him to listen to the Sacre du Printemps the, on the piano. Mm -hmm. First, 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 you know. He played and it for the first time for him. For, for, for yeah. the first time. And uh, there is in the in in the beginning, it's very quiet, nice, and uh, like yes. a, a little bit Russian, I think, song, you know. And then comes a little bit faster, and then comes one moment, I, I'm not a musician, but this, it is... Mm, da, 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 it's the, the repetition da, da, of, of... The repetition of the same of kind... Of the same chord. Chord, and... Uh, and Jack, you said, how long will last these things? He said, as long as it's necessary. Throughout his life, Diaghilev had shown a rare talent to sense talent. He recognized Stravinsky's genius way ahead of the rest of the world. And he showed the same sensitivity in years to come with other artists. It's the first time that anybody used uh, great painters. Yeah. Even when I came in first, I did Rossignol, and that was Matisse. First of all, I didn't know who Matisse was. We just came from Russia. Yeah. I really was stupid at the time. Didn't know anything. First of all, couldn't speak a word of French, nothing, not one, nothing, English or French, nothing. You see, only Russian. And they had to explain to me, this is Matisse. Ah, uh -huh, so who Matisse? A painter, so what? You know, for me, a painter is a painter. The mm -hmm. second body was Barabao. Barabao. Trillio again came yes, in. Yes. I didn't know who it was, Trillio. Oh, and then Rouault came in, and Braque, and then Durand was there. Everybody was there, you see? Because now, all of these people are great. Diaghilev's love for his native country was evident in most of his presentations. In the fairy tale Petrushka, he, Stravinsky and Benoit, again delved into the mystique of the Russian character.
So there he is, Nierzynski, as Petrushka. He looks a bit limp there, but he had an awful lot of energy when he got into his cell and wanted to get out. He was a bit elongated here. I think he was a bit shorter. But otherwise, he's all right. Some critics were a little confused by the music, but of course it was only 1911. But it didn't take away from the overwhelming success. Not so three years later, the Vienna Opera. At a dress rehearsal and in the presence of Stravinsky, the orchestra refused to play what they called dirty music, not fit for the sacred walls of the Vienna Opera. It took all the aggressive skill to placate them a bit, but still, they continued to sabotage the music all through the performances. Well, consequently, it was played only three times there. During the rehearsals of Petrushka, a break came between Diaghilev and Benoit. The latter accused Diaghilev of a double cross and resigned from the company. Fights were a natural part of Diaghilev's life. He fought with everybody, primarily about money. He took enormous financial gambles in order to realize his dreams. And came the day of reckoning, he could not meet the obligations. Money was the main thing. He quarreled with everybody about money because he promised the money, almost telling, after tomorrow, you will have it. And they had no money. Everybody worked almost for nothing, you see. Credits were everywhere, you see. People seen that this is of uh, great value, you see. They've seen that there's nobody behind it who making any fortune out of it. And he didn't have a penny. That's right. You know, naturally, Penny didn't have his own. The Ginpul gave him Baron to Gainsbourg, Russian uh, Baron, gave him million dollars, million rubles. Then Beecham gave him money, and then Rodemir gave him money, and uh, Coco Chanel gave Coco him Coco Chanel used to supply him with money. You know. mm. So that's how, but he had only one suit. All his life, he had a one suit. And Very well pressed. Very nice, very clean, but one suit, one coat, one hat, and one, nothing else. And when he died, you know, he had everything was rotten. You know, all these shirts were uh, uh, with true, uh, with uh, holes, with holes, it was terrible. Money is everything. Diaghilev always was like a beggar with a hat. But despite financial difficulties, Jagilev always managed to break grounds. During the first seasons, he was totally immersed in the education and promotion of his favorite Nijinsky, whom he intended to make the greatest dancer in the world. And when he also decided to let Nijinsky do the choreography, Fokin fell out of grace and eventually had to leave the company. The change was made in a cruel and callous manner. In 1912, Diaghilev persuaded the reluctant Debussy to give him the rights to the suite La Prémédie d'un Faune. This was to be Nijinsky's first choreographic effort. Naturally, he was also to dance the main role. Designs were by Bakst.
This was no dancing the way one knew it, but a sequence of profile movements resembling the Greek friezes. The audience burst out in cat calls and whistles, offended by the innovation and by Nijinsky's last erotic pose of the fawn. I remember I was told the first time the Premédie de Fawn was not accepted. The audience was very cool to it. He stopped it and had Nijinsky and the company repeat it again, just to teach them what it was like. Well, that happened to us in Paris also. Did they? Yes, with Nijinsky's Romeo and Juliet. Oh, I remember You that. remember? Well, we of had course, to we were both on that stage. Yes. We had to start the ballet all over again. It was very exciting. I thought he enjoyed the evening. The riot. The <laughs> there riot. was a riot in front. And no one was enjoying himself more than Jagler, <coughs> who was wandering up and down the back there. It was thoroughly enjoyed it. He liked what you call a scandal. He didn't okay. mind that, you see. Yes. It was quite a different thing. It was sheer, bad, stupid criticism that upset him very much. We, I know only one thing, that he... Uh, didn't let one critic in anymore, you know, was a man by the name of Newman, music critic that hated uh, Stravinsky, um, like Sacre de Printemps, been written, mm. how awful it was, and so he always criticized Diaglip. So Diaglip stopped giving him tickets or even didn't let him to come in. He looked at criticism, he listened to criticism, but I can only really say honestly again that he still went his own way. The Bellerys toured Europe and in 1913 were invited to South America. Crossing the ocean presented an ordeal to Diaghilev. He had been told by a fortune teller that he would die on water and so he remained behind and departed for a vacation to his favorite Venice. He was very superstitious. I remember at that time I, I was wearing a hat and I once put my hat on the, on the bed, on my bed. And Jagdiff came into my room. We were going to rehearsal, going to a museum. I don't know. He said, oh. he saw that hat on the bed and he said, it's death, it's death. And he crossed himself three times. And he couldn't bear to see a black cat. Did you ever cross the channel with him? Yes. How did he behave? R rushed to his cabin, was violently sick, and then waited until the boat had well docked and everybody was off. And then he got off very slowly, terrified and white faced and pale. But someone else sailed on that boat to South America. Someone who was to deliver him the shock of his life. A few months before the trip, a young lady by the name of Romola di Polska had joined the company. Four days after they arrived in Buenos Aires, the shaking Vasily, Diagolo's valet, dispatched a telegram. Nijinsky and Romola were married. Diaghilev's reaction was volcanic. He cursed and raged and plunged into a hysteria close to a breakdown. His friends took him to Naples, where he indulged himself in a string of love affairs doused with tears. But hurt as he was, his ego would not allow him to be destroyed by one man, however loved. As soon as the bacchanalia was over, he returned to business. A cold and personal telegram signed by the company's regisseur was sent to Nijinsky, informing him that his services were no longer needed. Those were hard times, financially and emotionally. But Diaghilev was not a man to succumb to adversity. He had built his own secular world where he was king, and it was about to collapse and topple him from his throne. He could not envisage that. In 1914, at the Bolshoi Theater in Moscow, he discovered a possible new star, Leonid Massin. Immediately, he tried to convince the young man to leave Russia and join the Ballerys in Europe. I was walking in that uh, street, uh, Mesnitska, I think it's called, with colleagues of the theater, and he used to say, 
Well, why you, why do you go? You have career here. It's foolish of you. Don't do it. Don't go. Remain. Just say no. That's all. So I made the point of that. I said I will say no. You see. So when the, the time came, I come to the hotel and up to the door, I had that no in my mouth. And then something happened. I come out and said, yes, Mr. Degel, I will come. <laughs> Nassine soon replaced Nijinsky in Diaghilev's affection. Again, as in Nijinsky's case, he took over his favorite's life, educating him and promoting his career. Diaghilev was a molder of talent and delighted in the process, especially when it was tied with his emotional attachment. When I was 19, 20, I came to Venice for the first time, and I was staying at the Lido, and we'd come over about half past six in the evening. And for the next hour and a half or two hours, it was going from one museum and one church to the other. And you know, when you're very young, you're very stupid. And I much sooner have had that hour and a half more on the Lido. Now I realize how wonderful it was, because it educated me. I mean, my whole career, my whole career I owe entirely to the education and to the knowledge that Diaghilev gave me. He was rather like a father to me. Very, very strict, very firm with me, uh, demanding uh, obedience and uh, discipline. But also, on the other side, he showed me such understanding and kindness and affection. I mean, all my life, after all, I owe him my career. I remember everything what he said. I remember one phrase he said to me, you know, in life, you can do everything with taste and nothing without taste, which is so very true. I remember Jagli was a, always a very, um, how am I say, very uh, careful about it. He used to send us to the concerts and send us uh, to the exhibitions to see what was going on. Each time I go to the museum who I met, Diaghilev. Then one day he said, Pavlov, I'm getting sick of you. Where I go, you are there. So I thought that he's mad at me. So I said, Mr. Diaghilev, this is the story. So he said, Pavlov, I wish everybody, every man would go to the museums here. And they play cards, and they don't sleep, and in the morning they don't go to the lesson, you see. So, for the man, he wasn't so. Jagalov enjoyed company, especially that of the rich, powerful, and famous. A snob, a believer in a caste system, he built up an image of someone exceptional, someone whose taste was not to be questioned, a man above the crowd. He disliked democracy, the populace was not for him. I was invited very few times with him considering, you know, that he always had lunch, uh, luncheons and dinner with 12 people, at least with, you know, like Picasso and uh, Deran and uh, the, the, the musician and Stravinsky and, I, I mean, uh, Sir Thomas Beecham, you name it, every Poco Chanel. And uh, I, I was just a little girl you know, that was, uh, I mean, it didn't count. I really didn't know him. I never spent time with him. I mean, in private life, very rarely, very rarely. He invited a couple of times, I was uh, sometimes to, you know, to, to dinner or to lunch, for instance. He would invite and give us a little lunch. Well, when I asked him once, I met him in the uh, park outside, I said, Mr. Jagger, I would like uh, you come to uh, our new little apartment to have lunch with us. He said, well, I'm so busy. I said, you know who will uh, uh, cook? Mr. Balanchin. And Mr. Balanchin, he cook very well. Oh, he said, yeah. well, maybe I will find time. 
And then I prepared the dinner was a disaster. Because everything that I thought to do, I wanted to make like artichaut, fond artichaut, real ones, you know, with mushrooms on top and this and that. And one thing that succeeded, it was the artichaut because you couldn't help it because they were already, God made them anyhow. So I <laughs> served them and then I did um, uh, uh, some kind of a cutlet Russian, you know, the meatballs yeah. uh, with something, you know. Also, they fell apart and then I had to mash them. And so I served again, what looked gray. And he says, what is this? I say, it's a cutlet allergic. He says, it's a porridge again. And then next, what? And next I brought, I thought to make baked apples with strawberries inside, you know, when it baked, it fell apart. When I served, it was, a, he says, the third, number three, porridge. porridge. <laughs> Something <laughs> like, that's how it was. <laughs> The war, like all wars, swept in changes, stripping the world of past tastes. In art, there came a harsh wave of cubism and futurism. And Diaghilev at once brought it to the stage in the ballet parade. By Cocteau, music by Satie, decor by Picasso, and choreography by Machine. rang in and with it came another shock for the world, the Russian Revolution. It cut Yagolev and other Russians from the dream of ever returning to their native land. In 1921, Yagolev's personal life repeated itself. Messin married a lovely dancer, Vera Savina, and not waiting to be dismissed, left the company. If Nizhinsky's marriage left Diaghilev hysterical, Massin's departure rendered him suicidal. Fearing for his life, friends would not leave him alone, and it took a long time to bring him back to normality, though he never regained the same verb. his career, Diaghilev had financial trouble. He raised money, lost it, and raised it again. In 1921, in a desperate attempt to make a coup, he turned the clock back and staged a classical ballet, Tchaikovsky's Sleeping Beauty. It was once glorious and disastrous. Diaghilev's last grandiose spectacle. It was presented in London at the Alhambra in November 1921. This production sent Diaghilev into financial ruin for four years. Despite previous rows with Diaghilev, Bax had come back to this fabulous and fatal production. It was a job of enormous proportion for which he received not one cent. He walked out, never to return. Bax died in 1924, and Diaghilev sobbed hysterically at his funeral. Diaghilev was terribly upset. He never really got over the failure of the Sleeping Beauty. This was something that he offered London 
and they rejected it wholeheartedly. As he said, there was only one excitement, really, at the, uh, about the performance of The Sleeping Beauty in London, and that was, I was bankrupt. And I think after that, he decided that he must uh, work on simpler lines. One of the ballets that followed the troubles of Sleeping Beauty was Lenos, a creation of Stravinsky, Goncharova, with choreography by Bronislava Nijenska. all the trials and tribulations of that time, but gradually the company returned to normal, and in 1922, Monte Carlo became its permanent home. By then, many dancers managed to immigrate from Russia. Jagger was also looking for talent from other countries, and among those recruited was a young girl, Alice Marks, who became Alicia Markova, just as earlier Hilda Munnings became Lydia Sokolova. A new kind of company began to emerge, for which Jagalov was constantly auditioning dancers. He looked at me and he said, uh, what are your measurements? I said, measurement? Nobody, measurement? Nobody ever asked my measurement before. I said, are you buying a horse? or you are uh, engaging a dancer. I said, maybe you want to see my teeth. Like, uh, you know, I, I'm horrified now when I think <laughs> it was so fresh. But then, now I know I ask some girls when I engage also their measurement because I probably was on the fat side. Not probably, I was. Le Bal, I loved Le Bal. Kiriko, which I danced with Anton Dolan who I never forget told me that uh, when I was fat, that he is not a, mo a m moving man, he is a dancer. And he said, Mr. Zagreb, she must get thin, because I'm not a piano mover, exactly what he said. He liked the slim, long-limbed dancer that is so popular today. He really was the first person to take an interest in that shape in a dancer. We finished our lesson. You did very well today. Uh, yeah, I hope you will not forget about what I said today. 
And now we finish, and don't remember about especially your pobre bra, and your position of your neck and neck. Goodbye. Thank, Thank you very much. Okay. And step, and step, together, now step, and third arabesque, and pose, and plie, one, Everywhere in the world, dancers are still passing on the inheritance of the relatively short jaggle of years when they worked with that unique company. From this point of vantage, it is difficult to assess the quality of the company, for they had no competition, and therefore, no measure of comparison. I think, on the whole, the Corps de Berry was weak, the actual Corps de Berry. But again, I think, you know, he was extraordinarily kind. And there were any amount of refugee dancers of not very high ability in the Corps, in fact, very low ability, that he really gave jobs to, you know. In all, I must say, it was a disastrous company. Awful dancers, except for soloists. Soloists always were good, you know, young people, and like Dolin was lovely, yeah. wonderful dancer when he was young, danced on points, it was acrobatic, and also yeah. the fire of, you know, all specific came in, and we were young and good dancers. There's no question that the, the corps de ballet of the Diaghilev company does not and could not compare with the Royal Ballet, with Festival Ballet, with the ABC in America, or the New York City Ballet. There's no question. What I do think, though, that the principles of the company, me, Lifa, Balanchin, Danilova, yourself, uh, Nikitin, and so many others, uh, Lubov Chernyshova, Lydia Sokolova, who was English, of course, there's no question that they, I think, are much more, uh, their personalities were so strong. Because Jadliff liked personalities. I must say, the idea of him projecting her own personality amuses me, because that was the last thing he ever allowed. He just, just, oh no, he, there was nothing of that at all. I got terribly ticked off once in Berlin for after a, a variation I'd done that certainly had a very big success, and I had to keep coming back to bow. He came onto the stage after, so I thought, how lovely, now he's going to tell me how well I dance. And he just said, I don't like the way you bow. Well, there was too much, too much personality in it for him, you see. He didn't like when we did too much emotion on the stage. He likes pure dance, but no any uh, too much feeling. Uh, for instance, one uh, uh, variation I dance, and the end I have news of uh, silence. Silence. Uh, silence. And in the end, I forget about it. And he said, oh. And then I grew. And immediately, uh, Mr. Jagrov came after performing. He said, uh, what do you suppose? Our th theater is very serious theater. Why you dance as music hall? It's not music hall. <laughs> the last years of the Ballet Russe were prolific. Jagrov continued to look for new painters and composers and his entourage was at its most spectacular. Auric, Matisse, Braque, Picasso, Utrillo, Marie-Laurence Saint, Derain, Cocteau, De Chirico, Max Ernst, Miro, all contributing their talent to new productions. But some critics felt that an acid quality had crept into the ballet. Jagloff paid no heed to them. Times were changing, and he changed with them. Constructivism had come from Soviet Union, and he immediately adapted that style to his ballet. There was Padassier, sets by Yakulov to Prokofiev's music, and La Chatte, which had a celluloid set by Naum Gabo and Anton Pevsner, which gave the impression of a floating laboratory. La Chatte was choreographed by Balanchine. Diaghilev had recognized very quickly the all-around talent of this young dancer and gave him a chance at choreography. And so he staged Barabao, a ballet with Chaplin-esque overtones set by Utrillo 
Music by a young Italian composer, Vittorio Rietti. Ah, oh. that brings memories. You, yes. <laughs> you know what, uh, what, what was that? Barabao? Yes, it was uh, the music for the, uh, the variation of, uh, of the officer who was danced by Lifard. I received a, a, a wire, a telegram from Jagilev asking me to meet him uh, in Venice uh, because he had heard about me, you see. He had heard uh, of this young Italian composer and they had told him that it was exactly the kind of music which, which he, was, uh, uh, he was after at that, um, at that time. And then I met him and um, and I had, and I played for him everything that I had, that I had. That, you know, Djagilev wanted to, 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 to know everything, to hear every note of everything. Barabao was followed by a string of Balanchine successes. La Pastorale, La Chatte, Prodigal Son, and Apollon Musagette. Apollon marked the beginning of the partnership between two strongest talents to emerge from the Valeris, Valanchine and Stravinsky. I never had anything uh, that he didn't like, really. He liked it uh, all. We quarrel, of course, uh, but Jagleb didn't like variation of the Terpsichore. In Apollo. In Apollo. Also, he didn't like that music. See, he says it's, it's too long. He says it's boring, because, and so, of course, I quarreled him. I said that variation was great, only your ballerina is awful. That's Nikitin. Finally, that when we did without, you know, somewhere in England or something, he would cut this variation out. Oh. He does. That's probably the two girls and probably the... Okay. But as soon as it's Stravinsky arriving, he heard. I heard Stravinsky rhyming, put it back. <laughs> so he was scared to death of Stravinsky. So as soon as Stravinsky rhyming, we had to rehearse again and put back this variation. Now, Prokofiev yeah. uh, didn't like Prodigal Son, my interpretation, my, the way I did it. Because Prokofiev really is uh, passé. I mean, in his mind, he's a very good chess player, and that's how he thinks, you see. And, and he wanted to have uh, this being done, you know, in a style of old, like opera, like Rigoletto, people dressed in, you know, these things, and, and he wanted to have real gut with real wine drinking and, you know, real people with mustache. See, and I made the kind of protoplasma out of them, you know, and he hated, he screamed. So the I gave him, she said that you, it's not your business, you, see, you don't understand anything, you are stupid. You live on singing, dancing, and so that shut up, and if you don't like, get out. With the success of so many new ballets and the financial side secured, the morale of the company picked up, and there were many light-hearted moments. Do you remember the time when George Balanchine took your place? My goodness me. Uh, for us, I went down with double pneumonia. And it happened very suddenly, and we had a special performance of Rossignol for the uh, princess. And uh, the, the things that George had given me to dance in his choreography, apparently, I mean, the, there wasn't anybody who could uh, do it at a moment's notice. So Diaghilev called the uh, princess and said, that's impossible because there have been two girls, you know, sick, so we can do it. And she says, I don't care. Tell Balanchine to dance. To draw. <laughs> so Daniel says, You dance. I said, How could I dance? I'm, you know, like, <laughs> strong man. You do what you can. So I put some tights. He was like a strong man, you know, with big nose. And we went into that cage. And of course, it was laughed. The public just laughed. And the, our <laughs> company was laughing. And Grigory was dying king, the emperor, was laughing like mad and said, everybody, if you don't stop laughing, I will all you, you know, will fire all of you. And ha, 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 he laughed himself. Diaghilev was laughing so that they took him to the house. 1928 was the year of Diaghilev's 20th season in Paris. 
and the company was secretly preparing an anniversary celebration. Somehow, the secret leaked out, and Jagalov called the company on stage. Ladies and gentlemen, he said, it has come to my knowledge that you intend celebrating my 20th season in Paris. I implore you not to act on it. A jubilee is the beginning of an end, something that rounds off a career, but I'm not ready for it. I wish to continue working. He paused for a moment and then added, I wish to remain always young, but time didn't hear him. He was visibly slowing down, and his diabetes, which has been afflicting him for some time, now was erupting in boils that had difficulty in healing. Diaghilev's interest in the ballet began to fade. He was a creator of creators, and his personal passions had to be irrevocably entangled with his achievements. That was no more. You know, I think it's a little like the story when uh, he revived, as you know, Massy with Massine's choreography, he revived Le Sac de Printemps. Mm -hmm. Chanel paid for it. It was an enormous revival. It cost thousands and thousands of francs or dollars or pounds. It doesn't matter which. And you know, as he said himself, he said that to me, you know, I was very disappointed in the revival. There was no more excitement. They'd heard German guns, so the explosions of Stravinsky's music really meant nothing. And I was frankly disappointed. I think Jagdiv was always a little disappointed with success because he loved to fight failures. I remember, I think, always that I saw him the last time. I was in a concert at daytime in March, probably, in Paris. And suddenly I saw him at the ending uh, uh, um, Jagdiv. Coming, wait, wait, wait a moment, I will show you something. He had a fur coat, almost summer, but he had a fur coat. He opened his fur coat this way, look. I said, my goodness, you, you lost so much weight. This is after last he died, you know. I said, and I thought, he has a new love, probably. He needed something fresh in his life. He needed something new, not only in his artistic life, in his personal life. And he did, as you know, he met Igor Markevich towards the end of his life. And then for the last time, his interest flared up again. He decided to present the young pianist composer Igor Markevich and open him to fame. Preceded by a splash of publicity, he was to play his own concert for piano and orchestra but the debut was a fiasco. Diaghilev's hopes for the success of his favorite crashed, and his illness took a turn for the worse. On July 26th, the last day of the 1929 season, the company was assembled on the stage and Diaghilev faced them. He wished the company a good holiday and advised them that all the contracts for next season were signed. He was supposed to go to Paris for a cure, but he disregarded the doctor's orders and went to Munich in pursuit of Markevich. After 10 days, Markevich left him, alone and hurting with the thought that his role of a creator was finished, he went to Venice. For a while, he showed signs of improvement, only to fall into a relapse with pains and fever. Then he dropped into a coma. His friends, Kokno, Lifar, and Monsieur Serp, watched over him all night. They say there was a storm, the water rising high in the canals. By morning, his breathing stopped, and the prediction was fulfilled. He died on the water, August 19, 1929, in his favorite place, Venice. Ironically, a few years later, Markevich married Kira, Nijinsky's daughter. The circle was complete. George Valentine, I think then he was your husband, wasn't he, at that time? Lydia Lopakova and I, we were given permission to appear in the first English talkie in London. It, the film was called Dark Red Roses, and we were resting in the afternoon because they were going to 
do the movie in the evening. They were going to shoot it in the evening. And suddenly a boy came around the placard. I was sitting on a chair, deck chair, and I saw a placard, Death of a Great Empresario. And instinctively, I knew it was Jackie. I was staying with friends down at a uh, seaside, Little Hampton. And the uh, boy in the, uh, he always used to deliver the evening paper to these friends I was staying with. And uh, that evening, I think I was in the garden and I saw him drop the paper by the gate and I went down and uh, I suddenly saw the newspaper lying there. And if I may say, that was the biggest shock I ever had in my life. I was in uh, south of France, I remember Hotel Negresco. Uh, I was doing my hair. I was staying with Ivan Marzuchin's wife. And uh, I, they brought the afternoon paper, and there was Sergei, the Jagilov is dead. This is interesting that a career like that came to an end that abruptly, and there is no kind of a garland around it, as they, so to speak, that you know people perhaps cried or got together or did anything. It just disappeared. Absolutely into thin air. Just well, as you say, it was crash, boom, crash. 